right. Can everybody hear me? Okay, is it? Lloyd, you can hear me okay back there? Yes, I can. All right. So welcome to the forum on Wednesday, July the 6th. Um, we've got, I feel like we have, as every forum that we present, a very interesting forum. We've taken time to talk to these presenters and to look what kind of questions that you might ask. So we're trying, you won't be stumping our presenters today. They're ready for everything. And I also think today's, no pressure. Um, today's topic is very um, timely with the fair coming up and the crops coming in and a lot of things happening. And these, these ladies and their organizations and businesses are super, super busy. And, um, and Barbara said last week, the Northern market right now is so much fun. I don't know if that's something on your to-do list on Saturday mornings, but it is something you should do because it's just, it's, and they actually, I didn't realize they sell wine there. <laughs> and not, not only that, but they let you taste the wine there. Yeah. Well, Kudos to that, that. yeah. So um, on behalf of myself, I'm Phoebe Benzenberg and Barbara Bynum, Kathy Hebers, and Judy M. Files. Thank you for attending. Some of you attend every week, no matter what. Some of you ask questions every week, no matter what. And it's a good time for us to tell, say to you that we appreciate your attendance and your, your interest in what happens around Montrose. If you ever have a subject that you feel like we have never broached, there's some things that we won't, but we are interested in knowing if there's something you would like us to present, if it fits our parameters, we'll certainly look into that. So please let us know. And also, um, you can bring friends you, <laughs> of all ages, and no matter how they identify themselves, we would love to have them come. So when you have a really interesting forum, please tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell your coffee group, tell your book clubs, tell your nonprofit boards what's going on and, and see if they would be interested in coming. We've got some really, really good um, topics and things coming up, like one will be to, it's gonna be held at the new police headquarters. We cannot give you a date, but that will happen soon. So they'll be letting us kind of walk around and see the, their new digs. So that's gonna be a good one. We've got one coming up. Well, I'm not even going to tell you. you. If you're not on the mailing list, if you're not on the email list, which is the only way you'll get our form topics, you need to talk to us and we'll make sure that you can get that. So you know, we don't want you to miss. It's also in the Daily Press, um, I think on the Friday before the Saturday before um, it comes out. So with that being said, that I'm not going to say anything else. I'm going to introduce our speakers. Like I said, we have three. I'm going to introduce each one as they present. So we're gonna start with Penelope Powell with the Ballard Food Partnership. Um, she is, the, yeah, that's, the, I'll let her talk about the partnership. It's a very critical part of um, Food to Fork and, produce and, and um, supporting our producers in agriculture. Uh, Penelope in her bio says she's been volunteering for years, and she has been, and she was, with the Valley Food Partnership included as board treasurer, Penelope joined the VFP staff as executive director in March of 2021. Agriculture has a story throughout her life, coming from multi-generational commodity crop farmers to working on a small, locally focused organic farm to having a home garden. Penelope's career has mostly focused on nonprofit administration at a variety of different agencies, and she is excited to finally marry her skills and her passion. She is originally from North Carolina, but has lived in Colorado since 2005. And in 2015, her family finally moved over to the Western Slope and are proud to call Montrose home. It took you 10 years to get over here. Yeah, that's a long time. In her free time, Penelope practices yoga, she also hikes, soaks in hot springs, and enjoys spending time with her family and friends. So, we'll start with Penelope, we'll go to the farmer's market, and then we'll talk with, or we'll, you'll have the privilege of hearing Jen Proc with Kennekin Farms, not farms, I'm sorry, Kennekin Meat Processing. So, this is Penelope again. Can I just remind everybody one thing? Questions at the end. So, keep your questions up here. At the end, after all three speakers, we'll bring the microphone to you so everybody can hear the question and we'll answer your questions at the very end. So without talking anymore, Penelope, here you go. Thank you, Phoebe, for the invitation to come 
come speak with you this morning. As Phoebe said, my name is Penelope, and I'm happy, happy to be here this morning. Um, has anyone had their local cherries yet? Fresh local cherries, okay. If you haven't, you need to go get them. <laughs> they're at the farmer's market, they're at Straw Hat, they're at Honey Acres Farm Stand, they're, they're all over. Um, but that is partly what Valley Blue Partnership is here to do, is to connect local agriculture and local people. So, I need my clicker, I've got three hands. where the magic spot is. It was just working. Getting this last word. You want to just click it? So what that means is we want to ensure that food, so vegetables, fruit, meats, continue to be raised in this valley and that that same food is eaten by people in this valley. And um, that is moving towards the vision of a resilient regional food system that sustains the land, producers, and healthy communities. So food is fairly, um, for some of us, easily accessible. You can just head to City Market, Safeway, wherever your choice is and purchase that um, food that you need. And there's a lot, a lot, a lot of benefits to local food. I think we can all agree that food is the cornerstone of our livelihoods, is the foundation of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and the amount of pleasure and joy that can come from food is not to be underestimated. It's a critical part of our culture, our health, and our well-being. On top of that, agriculture itself is key to our livelihoods. So it is because of farmers and ranchers growing the food that you eat that allows you to come be at this presentation this morning, that allows our doctors to be doctors, and that allows our innovators to make new inventions, and so forth and so on. So, all of these roles are, are, I think, easily taken for granted, but when we stop and pause, we realize we can't, we can't do without. So, however, our current food system is incredibly complex and precarious. So, uh, where many go hungry, only a few profit, and our environment is suffering. We're actually losing farmers and ranchers, uh, or excuse me, farmlands at an unsustainable rate. 2,000 acres of agricultural land paved over, fragmented, or converted in a way that jeopardizes um, its use for farming. So we have food is necessary, <laughs> but we're losing the ways that we make food. Um, that is not voting well um, for our ongoing sustainability. And unfortunately, because of the complexity of the system, it's incredibly vulnerable. Um, I think in various ways, we all experience supply chain issues with COVID, and that's um, something that we all have felt the vulnerability of lately, and food is a piece of that. Food can be equally as vulnerable in that supply chain. And there's hope. There's a recent published um, study by John Hopkins University that shows a greater reliance on regionally produced foods, improves food access and affordability while benefiting farmers and others in the food supply chain. So when you buy local food, it strengthens the local economy. You're putting money right into your neighbor's pockets. And then there's a multiplier effect with that. They are then spending their money locally, so it, it your money continues to recirculate into the local economy. It also has increased nutrition and flavor. 
So most of your, um, all your local farmers and ranchers are picking their um, produce at optimum ripeness, which increases the nutrition and health benefits of that food. I actually, one of my staff just sent me a study that showed that after two days of harvesting, you lose like 50% of the nutritional value. Like that, whoa, that, that blew my mind. I didn't realize it was quite that intense. <laughs> um, you have a lessened environmental impact, so you don't have as much um, transportation and as much vehicle, um, diesel and gas and the refrigerated trucks and all that. So um, less travel time for the food also lessens the environmental impact. You also have a safer food supply. You can look your farmer in the eye and, and know what they've done to your food and you can go see where it's grown. And then it creates a sense of place. So for me to know where my food comes from, and I've talked to other people that feel similarly, they, um, there becomes a sense of um, belonging that happens with that. So when you know your community and you know where you come from and you know who's making your food, you feel that sense of place and connection to that place and that creates that sense of belonging. So I, I, I know some of these might feel far-fetched, but, but <laughs> seeing some familiar faces that I hadn't seen yet. Um, so that is why local food. So I'm gonna give you a quick overview of the Valley Food Partnership. Um, so we work across the food supply chain. We work with producers, so farmers and ranchers with, through education, um, and then we also are supporting the next generation of farmers, and I'll dive more into all of this in a second. Um, we also are providing education for consumers, like today, why local food? What's the importance of it? How to access it? Um, we also want to ensure that we are promoting regenerative practices so agricultural practices that give back to the land, um, not just taking from the land. And we also work to increase access for all members of our community to um, connect to local food. History, I'm, I'm not gonna go over all this, um, but some interesting facts. We actually, our official name is Western Colorado Food and Agriculture Council, and that's because that entity under that name started in the North Fork Valley. Um, in 2007, we, Valley Food Partnership actually started as a steering committee from the Uncompadre Valley Alliance. Uh, in about 2011, they held a community meeting on local food and so many people showed up um, that they formed a steering committee from that. And then the following year we merged and that's how we got our nonprofit status. A lot of our work initially, um, at least how people were familiar with it, was with community gardens. And um, I feel like that was a very successful program that we had. A number of community gardens came about from that project. Um, we actually are no longer doing that because, and this is just my view of nonprofits, like ideally you, you work yourself out of a job. You meet your mission. <laughs> and so that's how I see that garden work is it, it met its mission. Um, it's functioning in and of itself. It doesn't need a third party to come in and support that. Um, everything else on here I'm gonna go over. So um, just know that we've had a nice long history, about 10, 10 plus years. I also am not gonna spend much time here because um, Sammy is gonna chat with you about the farmer's market, but just a, a brief overview. So the farmer's market is a program of Valley Food Partnership. Um, we, that would have happened in, oh, I need my history slide to remind me. Um, we started as their fiscal agent in, oh goodness, Sammy, help me. 2013. 2013, and then um, they, we adopted them as a full-fledged program in 2017. I will leave it at that because I'm guessing Sammy's gonna go into a lot more. So, I basically right now I'm just showing you how we're living our mission. So there's the farmer's market, which I think has the most public facing um, presence. And then we have a program called Local Pharmacy Rx. So Local Pharmacy Rx is a produce incentive program. So we are providing cooking and nutrition education to families 
that have lower resources. So that might mean lower income or trouble accessing food. Uh, so we're saying, hey, promoting cooking at home, promoting use of fresh ingredients, promoting nutrition. We also run this program for people that might be at risk of diet-related diseases. So it's twofold, people with food insecurities and diet-related diseases. So families come, usually it's families, there are individuals as well, come and take these cooking and nutrition education classes with the focus on local food. And then they get $50 per class to spend at a local food outlet. So Montrose Farmer's Market, Straw Hat, Honey Acres, all those other ones I already mentioned. Um, there are other vendors that accept those vouchers as well. So this is actually one of our longest running programs. It was a flagship program of Valley Food Partnerships. So far we've served 435 community members and over $51,000 reinvested in local farmers' food products. So that's one of the things I like about this program is it's not only helping families know what to do with um, cooking at home and fresh food so that they go to the farmer's market and see a Jerusalem artichoke and they're like, what the heck do I do with this? Gives them some ideas on what to do with that. And, but it also is putting that money back into local farmers and ranchers' pockets. So it's a win-win. We recently have kind of changed the face of this program. We used to use a strictly uh, one curriculum six-week program, but lately we have shifted that to really hear from the um, families that we're serving, what do they want to learn about, and we have found that to be far more successful. So we're providing programming that they're giving input to that interests them. Actually, one of our most popular ones that we just did this year um, was refrigerator pickles. So how to, how to pickle without all the canning. One of our, well, not one of, the newest program that we have is Cultivating Farmers and Ranchers That Thrive. And this is a beginner farmer rancher development program. We kicked it off this year. And there's, there's a number of reasons that we felt passionate about having a beginner farmer rancher program. One is ensuring the continuation of our valley's agricultural heritage. The average age of farmers is 65. Again, that's another not sustainable um, piece of, of the complexity of the food system. So what kind of the current landscape of this, and I gotta watch my time. I was like, I'll never talk for 20 minutes, but I love talking, so <laughs> I'm not having a problem. Um, oh, where was I going with that? Sustainability, average age. Average age, yeah. Five or five. Yeah. Yeah, good listening skills. <laughs> I don't know where I was going, but either either way, oh, I know, the, the landscape of kind of how this is working is you have a lot of folks that grew up in farming and ranching that are leaving farming and ranching. And you have a new generation of people that want to get into farming and ranching, but didn't grow up with it and, and have problems accessing it because of that um, part. So that's where we come in. And we have six program pillars up here. First is the participants. We do have a focus on low resource veteran um, and Hispanic recruitment with that. And that is with the vision of ensuring that our farmers and ranchers are mirroring our community and that there is access. And then we provide education. We are partnering with Holistic Management International, but also providing a number of community-wide programming. So we have something on Sunday, the youth ethnobotany tour. Um, we've gone up to Rogers Mesa for CSU Ag Experiment Station, and all of those have been open to the public. But mostly we're focusing on um, holistic production, but also a strong focus on business development, and we're partnering with Region 10 for different pieces of that, just to ensure, because a lot of people have the passion, but maybe not the business smarts um, to be successful. So that's why we're ensuring that that's a part of our education. Provide mentorship and internship. So that's more of that hands-on learning out of the classroom and partnering with um, veteran farmers and ranchers in this area. And it's amazing how many folks have popped up and said, hey, I want to mentor someone new. And it's a great chance for them to pass on their knowledge and 
their sense of um, contribution, but then also for that younger farmer and rancher to receive that support. Land access is huge. Um, land prices whew, soaring out of this um, world. And that's the other thing I've been really amazed at is how many people have reached out and said, hey, I have land I'd like for a beginner farmer rancher to be on. And so we've been collecting those names and then we have our cohort of participants and we match them. And we're not providing contractual matching, but just resource development and connections for those. And we've been, um, yeah, I've been really pleased with how the community has shown up with land access and support. Then we have a farmer rancher advisory team. That's just a group of farmers and ranchers that give us feedback on how we're doing <laughs> and saying, you're missing the mark here, but you're really rocking it here. Um, and last but not least, we're partnering with CSU to evaluate the effectiveness of the program. We just started in January, so I don't have a lot to, to share about it, um, but we did have, with no advertising, like practically none, we had 20 people our first year. So that was um, really promising to us. Regional Food System Partnership, this one gets a little bit more complex. Um, this was a planning grant, so really not a lot of um, implementation out into the community, but um, trying to put forth a framework for an information technology system that increases communication, coordination, and collaboration amongst all actors across the food supply chain. Um, with that model that we're putting forth, we're highlighting communication and coordination, the value of standardized record keeping. Let me tell you, most farmers and ranchers just have a little notepad in their back pocket, and that's where they write all their data on. Um, and we think there could be greater power and collaboration if that were to be digitized. And then using a new generation of decentralized and distributed software and hardware, so basically blockchain. Um, and the use of blockchain to manage producer data to increase efficiencies and profits. Like I said, this has just been in the planning phase. Next, we're moving into our proof of concept where um, a select number of producers are on the blockchain and um, doing some baseline communication to share data. Okay. Breaking news, this is the first group I have said this out loud to. Um, Soil Health Conference and Food and Farm Forum are merging this year, and we are putting on one agricultural conference. So that will be January 27th and 28th, or whatever that Friday and Saturday is. So this is a, um, not just a Valley Food Partnership thing, it is a cross-collaborative effort. You've got Shabano Conservation District, NRCS, <coughs> Rocky Mountain Farmers Union, CSU Extension, I know I'm forgetting folks, but a big, big collaborative effort. And we're, um, this came about because the only agricultural conferences in our state were over in the front range and farmers and ranchers weren't going. And so we wanted to offer an opportunity for <coughs> learning to happen here as well as networking um, for an often isolated population. So, Love and Local Guides is another thing um, that we do. We've got some in the back by the coffee. This is one way that we help promote local producers, and we also ensure that the community knows how and where to access local food. So you've got um, 80 plus producers in a six county region, 20 plus organizational partners that have said we support local food, and um, this is our sixth edition, and we have 25,000 copies that we are still distributing. So make sure to pick one up. They're also all over town. There's Office of Business and Tourism, <coughs> different stores. Um, we're dipping into food policy. I'll leave it at that. Bringing people together for um, local solutions for local problems and helping them. Facilitating the conversation in which they are, the community's coming up with those solutions themselves. We have our doing things a little differently this year with our fundraising event. So we are hosting a 30, 50, and 70 mile time to bike ride called the Crop Duster. You are supposed to giggle at that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the roots are gonna highlight our agricultural heritage. So we have selected farms around the route. 
Um, and then there'll be a fun after party at the Montrose Rotary Amphitheater, live music, local food, beverages, um, kids 12 and under are free to that. How you can get involved, we always are looking for volunteers, cooking and nutrition, helping with the market, mentoring a beginner farmer rancher, donations and sponsorships are welcome to a number of our events. And then as far as resources go, we agricultural land for beginner farmers, farm equipment, cooking supplies, all that and with that there is my contact information i also have my business card so i'm happy to pass those out and we're going to do questions at the end and i'm going to pass this on to actually i think maybe phoebe will introduce sammy Oh, thanks, Penelope. And, and actually, that lo local book is back at the table, so you can you don't have to take one. You can take five and hand them out. So yeah, take as many as you need. There's more in the box. So our next speaker is Sammy Altieri. She is the project manager for the Montrose Farmers Market. She started working for Valley Food Partnership in 2020 and has started working with the Farmers Market this year. And as Penelope said, the market's underneath Valley Food Partnership. As the project manager, Sammy will be supporting the market through grant activities, including marketing, promotion, and increasing direct consumer access to local foods. She's passionate about supporting local agriculture, small business, and building community. She enjoys catching some music when she can and going to the hot springs. She's originally from the Eastern Shore of Maryland but has enjoyed her new home in the mountains of Western Colorado. So, you guys, let's welcome Sammy to talk about the Montrose Farmers Market. Good morning, everybody. Can everyone hear me all right? No. Oh, well, you're just gonna have to read my lips then. All right, um, hi, so I'm Samuel Terry. Um, I'm the manager of the Montrose Farmers Market. Um, like Katie said, I joined Valley Food Partnership in 2020 as the AmeriCorps Member Food Access Coordinator, um, and I worked with the market then and really fell in love with it. Um, I went home to Maryland, to Maryland for a couple months, but I was looking for any excuse to come back here to Colorado, and another position opened up here. Um, and anyway, I started working with the market this past January and recently stepped into this role as a manager in March. Um, so yeah, so I'm just going to be talking your ear off today about the farmer's market. If you haven't been, you should join us when you're every Saturday. So yeah, so the Montrose Farmer's Market is a program under Valley Food Partnership, and as Penelope said, our mission is to support local agriculture and support our regional food system. Um, and so as a market, we have basically four main mission goals connect local producers to consumer, just providing a place and space for people to meet their farmer and buy local food, and it's easy to access because it's right there, it's uh, Incubate beginner farmers and ranchers, helping those small businesses get started, having a place where they can sell. Um, provide food access services, as Penelope was saying, like making healthy local foods accessible to everyone in our community, not just for people who can traditionally afford it, but make it for everybody, um, and support community building. It's just, it's also just a fun place to hang out. It's a great place to be and meet your neighbors and just hang out at the farmer's market, and listen to good music and do some good shopping. I went a little crazy with history. Um, so I recently, in our closet, found this binder filled with newspaper clippings of the market throughout all the years. So I dug as much as I could into it, but I know I'm missing a lot. Um, Basic notes are we were the market was founded in 1978 by some local farmers and producers to really focus on supporting um, farmers and ranchers from the Western Slope. Um, some notable founders that I found through my study, and I'm sure I'm missing quite a few: um, Ed Chamberlain, Pamela Friend, Jean Austin, um, Bill Dwelly, and Bill Harriman of the Tri County River Extension Service. Those two helped started the market, um, and of course I'm probably missing some other notable names that people would recognize around here. Um, we are one of the oldest markets on the Western Slope, and we have had a couple name changes and location changes throughout the years. Um, again, based on my reading, at I think in the beginning, we were just referred to as the farmer's market because we were probably the only one around. Um, we were also known as the um, Uncompadre Farmer's Market that I found in my newspaper 
something. And it kind of, again, based on my quick research, looks like around 2002, 2003, we switched to the Montrose Farmers Market. Um, and we've had a couple locations. We've been on the fairgrounds for quite a while. Um, we've been on North First. I read in one newspaper clipping we were on um, North Fifth or South Fifth. Um, but we've been in the downtown Centennial Plaza area since about 2002. Um, and that is where we're currently located. We're on Centennial Plaza and South on Composite Avenue. Oh, and these are some other jewels that I found. Um, we have a whole box of pictures, but I just wanted to share some that I found. Um, and some of them had notes on the back. I don't have dates for these, unfortunately, but if you look to the picture on the right, we have Debris Buffalo Ranch. Um, to the left, we have Lady Starling Flowers. Um, if you look at this one on the left, that is Chamberlain Farms, and that one is a young Todd Chamberlain, according to the note on the back of that picture. So if anyone's familiar with Todd Chamberlain at the market, don't, I haven't told him I used his picture yet. <laughs> Here's some more pictures, Cowboy Don's Produce. But yeah, these are just the humble beginnings of the market. We were set up at the fairground just selling out the back of trucks and people would just come to get their local produce and local flowers and arts and things. So where we are now, again, like I said, we're still in Centennial Plaza. This year we have about 34 vendors and we're still receiving applications every week. Um, we definitely have room for growth. We still are the only year-round market on the Western Slope. I believe it's because we're just the only ones crazy enough to go year round. Um, we've seen a significant increase in our SNAP and Double Up food bug participation, and I'll get to that in our next slide about SNAP and Double Up. Um, I have a little bit of, uh, from our financial review of 2021. Each month we are showing record sales for the past two years, the majority of which were food sales, so we are seeing that increased demand for local food, which is awesome for what we do. Um, we now have two staff members, which is really exciting for us. Um, traditionally, farmers market managers are either um, volunteer positions or they're part-time positions that are paid, but um, we now, through the farmers market promotion grant, which I will get to in a second, um, we have the capacity and time to staff two members to help this market grow, and I'll get more to that in a second. Um, so like Nopi and Fat, we do have our food, acts pro pro food access programs at the farmer's market, and that's just to increase accessibility to local and healthy foods. Um, our most commonly used ones are <coughs> SNAP and Double Food Bucks program. Um, so SNAP stands for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Um, this is used through your EBT card, or maybe just commonly known as um, food stamps. Um, so people who have an EBT card can spend their dollars at the market, which is really great because that means that money can be spent locally and be put into farmers' pockets. So every time, um, so yeah, so customers can bring their EBT card to the market and pull out their SNAP dollars, almost like an EBT uh, ATM in that way. Um, and every time they pull a dollar of SNAP, they can bring out a dollar of double up food bucks. So what that is, is that's a matching grant um, funded through Nourish Colorado. Um, and these double up food bucks can be spent on fresh fruits and vegetables. So it's free money for EBT participants to spend on fresh fruits and vegetables. It promotes healthy eating. It's extra dollars in farmers and ranchers pockets. Um, so this is just me spreading the news. So if you know anyone with an EBT card, tell them that they can spend their money at the market and get twice as much money. Um, the other program we do, as Penelope said, was the Local Pharmacy Rx program. So again, participants who take those nutri nutritional and educational classes um, get those local, local Pharmacy Rx dollars, and those can also be spent on fresh fruits, fruits and vegetables at the market. Um, and all these programs are just to make fruits and vegetables and food at the market more um, accessible. And now we're going to get into the moving and shaking of the market. So this has been a grant that we've been trying for for a couple of years, and we finally got it in 2021. It is the Farmers Market Promotion Program Grant. Um, and the point of this grant is we have identified some needs at the market. Um, because while we are a really great community, and we have really great farmers, and we have a really great customer base, we have definitely seen potential and room for growth. Um, and we noticed that there's a lot more target audience that we could hit. You know, we have a very strong customer base and returner uh, customers, but 
there are definitely a lot of people that maybe we're not reaching to. Um, there is an increase in demand for local food, and we see that in our culture. We see that around here. We have a strong agricultural heritage here, and yet there's a lot of people that maybe we're not reaching because they don't think the market can be affordable. They might not know about SNAP and Double Up Food Bucks. Um, there's also language barriers. We currently only have one vendor right now who is fluent in Spanish. So that means we're missing a huge part of our community who could be shopping at the market. Um, so some of the needs that we've identified in the market is to broaden the market's appeal to multiple generations, cultures, and more low-income residents. Um, we also want to add a greater variety and number in types of vendors um, because competition is a good thing at a market. So if we have a more variety of produce vendors and meat vendors that have that competition in the market, and um, part of this grant is help identify those barriers to understand how can we get more vendors in the market. Um, we're also creating a, we also, the goal, another, sorry, let me start over. Another need that we identified in the market is to create a data tracking system so we can make informed decisions. Um, so we do have this grant, we do have this money, we do have the capacity and time to make some big changes with the market but we want to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our customers, um, of our vendors, and of our local farmers. And so we're de developing a data tracking system to figure out what needs we need to fill. Thank you. Um, so our three main goals of the Farmers Market Promotion Program is to develop a marketing strategy to increase demand for local food. So like I said, we have seen a demand for local food, but how can we get the word out for the market more? Um, so part of that is we're doing a logo redesign. We're doing promotion for um, just getting the word out, getting our goals as the market out. Um, the, the second goal is to increase the number of vendors and profits for vendors, so building that business strategy to understand how we can make this uh, market more sustainable after this grant is over. It's a, it's a three-year plan grant, um, and so how we can build a business strategy to make sure that the governance and the runnings of the market are sustainable not only for the vendors and producers, but for the people who are governing the market. So future market managers for the advisory committee to make sure that the market continues to grow and to thrive. Um, and yeah, that's part of the goal three, is create and implement that business model um, to ensure profitability, sustainability, and growth. So, sorry to talk about it with Valley Food Partnership, how you can support your local food system. The point I said, the market is only just one part of our local food system. Um, shopping locally is definitely a way to do it. So you can shop at the Montrose Farmer's Market or finding your local farm stand, finding your local farmer, and shopping directly with them. So, or places like Straw Hat Market, finding co-ops. Um, supporting a CSA, um, CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture, so you can subscribe to farmers um, and ranchers that have CSAs and get weekly or monthly boxes of produce or meats, depending on what your subscription is. Um, tell your friends. This is a wonderful place that people like to tour to, so next time you have family in the area or friends over, take them to that restaurant that like prides themselves on serving local ingredients and local food. Take them to the farmer's market. Um, show them around if you know any farms in the area, because I know when I first moved here to Western Colorado, seeing all the ranches and, and cows around here was super cool. Um, I grew up on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. We had a lot of chicken houses, which is not as exciting in my first year. <laughs> um, also in the market, we're also always looking for donations, sponsorships, and volunteers. If you want to get involved, I also have my business cards that I can hand out at the end. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I'll definitely be around to take questions at the end to answer more about the Montrose Farmers Market. Um, oh, and we're open every Saturday, so we are a year-round market. We're open every Saturday, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Centennial Plaza. Um, during the winter, that's from January to um, April, or every other weekend. Um, if you want to know more about our schedule during the winter, uh, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you. Um, both um, Penelope and Sammy made a reference to Straw Hat Farms, which is the store that's owned by the Bylers that's kind of catty corner or across the street from the market. So if you go to the market, go to the Straw Hat Farms. They're not affiliated with the market, but they're very, they're very close. And you guys, it's worth going in to see Karen Byler and going to her store. One of our founders too. One of your founders as well. So, um, so let's get to the meat of this program. <laughs> <laughs> right, Jen? Um, Kinnikin Meat Processing. Um, they 
Yeah, they're incredible. I find your business absolutely incredible. Je Zach and Jen grew up in Montrose and graduated from Montrose High School. Can I ask you what year you graduated? Do you mind? 1995, so you're still such a kid so for doing true. all this, yeah. <laughs> 1995, you and Zach both graduated in 1995. They then attended Colorado State University. Zach got his degree in animal science and Jen got hers in business. Together, they started Kennedy Processing in 2003. It has grown ever since. In 2008, they welcomed Trevor Proc, who will be a freshman at Montrose High School this year and he plays football and he also wrestles. So that'll keep you busy. Along with Kenneth and Processing, Zach and Jen own three pawn shops in Montrose and Delta and run a wild game outfitting business. So in their free time, <laughs> what is that? In your free time, they enjoy spending time on their Elk Ranch just outside Montrose on Kenneth and Road. So yeah. Please welcome Jen Prock as she tells us about Kennedy Process. Okay, I'm not as prepared as the first two, but that's okay. I can get through this. Um, so Kennedy Processing is has a lot of different parts to it. We, but all the animals that come in there and all the meat that is sold out of there starts here in our in our valley from you know, Grand Junction, Hotchkiss, Montrose, you right. But it's all, it's all in the valley. So if you're buying meat out of the front of my case, you're supporting our local, um, all the locals, I guess. Now the fish and the shrimp, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> but, and the chicken, I guess. But the beef, pork, lamb, elk, bison, all comes local. So a lot of it, if you buy it in there and it's fresh, it's never been frozen. So if you haven't been in there, you need to go in because you'll be spoiled after after today when you're all in there. Uh, Wednesdays, we do a senior and veteran discount program. So today is Wednesday. I expect to see all of your faces in there today. Um, so what, are, what are you saying there? I'm saying, come on, come on down. Um, so yeah, we started Kinnikin as, um, it was kind of an accident when we started it. We had been in the jerky business with our elk jerky and we were selling to Walmart. Um, we were young, way young, uh, and we couldn't quite make that work. Well, we had all the infrastructure. We had freezers and coolers and what I thought was what we needed to hang a wild game. Um, because when we had that, that uh, jerky business, Everybody was calling and being like, do you have some place to take the wild game? The hunters would call. And I, so I told Zach, I'm like, let's just hang this wild game since we're not going to do the jerky anymore. Well, they didn't really want us to just hang that wild game. <laughs> they wanted us to cut it. So uh, all of a sudden, we had all these people at our little place, garage on Kinnikin Road. And we just went from there. And then we, we had some employees that we needed to on because they were good, so we didn't know how to keep them on all, all you know, all the rest of the year, not just in the fall. So then we started, you know, doing the fairs, which is where we're headed to right now, and, and doing beef and pork, and and so we've just kind of grown over the last years. We've been down in town now, off the bypass. I think this is our sixth year, or maybe seventh. Um, we're USDA inspected, so uh, we have an inspector in there every day making sure we're doing right. Um, and so not only do we process and sell meat out to the public, but we also process for other ranchers that then take their meat to the farmer's market or take it to different restaurants and sell it. So we're, you know, we're all across the board from you know, taking care of the, the ranchers that are then in turn selling their own meat and taking care of the ranchers that we take and sell their meat. So there's, you know, there's a lot of different, I guess, ways that we're get we're supporting the, the local economy. Uh, what's coming up now is the fair. So um, and several fairs we do Gunnison's in a couple weeks, and then Norwood and then Montrose are three big ones. Uh, we'll get a little bit from Delta. 
in a couple weeks after that. But but the Montrose Fair, of course, is is the biggest one for us because it's our local one. Um, but all of those, if you buy an animal down there, a lot of them will come to us. We'll do them the way you want them, and then you take them home. And it supports it supports the kids, and so that's a that's a huge deal for our economy. So. I don't know, I think it's just time to open it for questions and I gave a quick overview and have these other girls up here and see what you guys have to ask us. <laughs> Quick question, Jen. How many employees do you guys have at Kilkins? We have 40 employees wow. right now. 40 employees left. And they're they're working. They're working. Yeah. <laughs> All the time. They, they, are. they don't even look up. Yeah. I mean they really don't. They've got if you ever go into their store out on the bypass, their rest I don't want to call it restaurant, but you can't go in and eat. You can it's got yeah, great, we have sandwiches yeah. and we do special. Yeah, but they're back there working like workers. Just yeah, like, they of course, are. they've got blood splattered all over. <laughs> so. no, I probably, I would, I will say, I have the best crew in Montrose. Uh, they have worked for me for a long time. Most of them have worked there, I don't know, 10 or 12, 15 years. So, uh, I have, as COVID hit and everybody had a hard time with their employees, and and even still, a lot of especially the restaurants and all are having trouble with labor. I haven't had, any, I'm lucky, but I haven't had any trouble with my labor. I have the best people in town working for me for sure. Well, you obviously treat them and, you know, they don't want to leave you either. So let's let's have you both, all three of you, come and just stand up here with Jen and we'll open it up for questions. So um, we'll start with Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you know. Thank you know. I was, uh, Penelope, I was really impressed by the knowledge uh, that uh, the vegetables lose two, uh, what, fifty percent of their nutrition after Bonkers, right? after two days. So I have a question for you. When I uh, I, uh, I go shopping with my wife at City Market, and when we go through the produce aisle, we look up there, you know, and it shows that Kroger is having these local farms, you know, John Harrell is up there, you know, front and center, and Takata Farms, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, we recently, uh, only the last five years or whatever, uh, Kroger decided not to purchase milk from uh, uh, this Western Slope. And that was one of the reasons why Whitfield Dairy went out of business, because they, they had to transport it and so forth, just made um, uh, infeasible, you know, they're not, not profitable. So the question I have for you is, what um, what is the relationship between the large grocery stores and the farmer's market? Well, with the farmer's market, thank you so much for... I mean, the, the, what, your the Valley... Valley Food Partnership. Right. Sure, sure. So thank you so much for your question. I did not know that about the dairy, so that's interesting. Keep in mind, there is a local Rocky W out of Olathe. Just a little plug for them. They do great cheeses, milks, ice cream. That wasn't your question. Um, so the, the historically, Valley Food Partnership has really focused on small and mid-sized farms, which tend to be more family farms, and haven't done a lot um, with the grocery stores, I would say. But the regional food system partnership that I showed at the end that's looking at use of blockchain to coordinate producer data, all of that is with the idea to increase access to markets for local farmers and ranchers. So right now to enter into Kroger or any of your um, larger grocery stores, there is a boat ton <laughs> of um, uh, I'm wondering, like uh, certifications they have to have, and um, it's it's it makes it highly inaccessible for your small to mid-sized farmers to access because that's just them working their farm and not doing the whole data side of things. So I, I don't know that I'm answering your question, but historically we we want to increase all market access for all local producers but there are a ton of barriers to them entering your larger store chains. What's that? That's why you own the market. That's, yeah, exactly. Um, and we recognize that that's easiest for a lot of people to shop at. So we wanna 
we're, we're working on that, but through a backdoor sort of way with the data because they require so much data, which is understandable, right? I mean, that's for your safety. <laughs> and it, it monopolizes who can sell into those markets. My question is for Jen. Jen, you mentioned the Elk Ranch. I know you used to raise cattle. Are you still raising anything and processing that? Yeah, we raise the elk still, um, and we do. That's where the elk and our meat shop comes from. It's from our, our farm. Is that gonna is Zach show up for Pitsy or do or no? Zach who? Trevor, I'm not Zach, Trevor. <laughs> Trevor. Yeah, no, Trevor is all hands on. He knows everything. Actually, he could probably take the whole thing over right now. Um, no, he's he's hundred percent involved. So not, any other questions? Because I have one for Sammy then, but thank you for letting me. Sammy, what's the criteria to become or to be a vendor at the market? I know there's some strict things that may surprise people. Yeah, um, so our main criteria is that they have to be sourced from the Western Slope, which I also understand can be a little bit of a subjective criteria depending on where you like cut off the Western Slope. Um, but otherwise, they just have to, it has to be made on the Western Slope. So if it's produce, it has to be grown here. Um, meat has to be raised here. If it's an artisan or like a craft, like someone who makes jewelry or um, bakes bread or something, it has to be made here on the Western Slope. Um, we don't require a business license. We don't require a business license, and I, that's kind of part of that business incubation is just like making it easier and accessible for um, smaller startups to get started with the market. Um, and then as far as like food licensing and criteria, we, they have to go, I have my vendors go through Jim Austin with the county. Um, and we accept a variety. If you have a commercial kitchen and you bake your, your bread with a commercial kitchen, great, we'll let you in. If you are under the cottage food license, um, also acceptable. Um, so we don't have a lot of barriers as far as licensing to join the market. Um, they do need to meet like food safety certification. Um, with at least cottage food safety, but um, otherwise they just have to be from the Western Slope. And liability insurance. Yes. And um, another piece of that business incubation is we also process sales tax. So um, if an entity doesn't have an individual license with the city, um, we can process that sales tax for them. And all, like Sandy said, under that support for new businesses. Good, thank you. So couple things that, um, that you can put in what I have to do file is um, when the new police station, for lack of a better word, opens up, right now you can't see it, it's behind the fence. But in all honesty, I mean, when the market's going and the fence is down and the police station's open and the, the one lane traffic westbound, it's gonna be just one lane there behind, that's gonna be, amazing and it's really going to highlight the market in a great way also if you go out to kind of, kind of processing out on the bypass and get a sandwich and look at the meat which even a vegetarian would leave there buying some meat um, <laughs> you can get on their email and they've got some great deals i, I think weekly they come out um, bundles they call them and they're they're worth going and getting and putting in the freezer so don't <coughs> get on their email list because that's that's a good email list to be on as well so if there aren't any more questions i'm going to you have a question Barbara? i have a quick oh. easy question <laughs> my husband usually takes and drops off the elephant but once i picked it up and it was south of town are you still processing south or are you processing in that new location no, for the last however everything years? Bypass and park. Everything. It's been a long time since I was yeah, charged with picking up the elk. <laughs> no, everything from the animal drop off to picking them up, it's all in that main location, right? On the south. Do you go pick up animals for people that can't bring them to you? We can. We don't do a ton of that, um, but it, it, if it's necessary, we certainly will. What's the most unusual animal that you've processed? Can you say? Do you, uh, is it, or is it just pretty much it's what pretty, you do? I mean, it's, we'll do some yak, um, but beef, the buffalo, you know, they're kind of 
they're big. And <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, really, we just do beef, pork, lamb on the mainstream, and then the elk and buffalo. And then what happens to the waste of the what's left? What what just the waste just, management? There's waste management. There it goes. All right. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. Well, honestly, um, a great presentation for all of you. Thank you very much. Could we give them one? <laughs> one, 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 one